Well, good morning, Apostles family. Welcome to worship. We're glad that you made it. If this is your first Sunday here, we're glad that you're here. Uh, The easiest way to connect to our church is that there's a connect box on the top of the screen and you can just click it. A form will come up. You can fill out any information that you're comfortable giving. And that'll be the easiest way for us to be able to connect with you, serve you, um, meet any need that we can or answer any questions. And we would love to be able uh, to do that with you. So today... I want to remind you um, that Christ loves you. He loves you. It may be just a really simple truth that you maybe intellectually know, but I just want to remind you that Christ loves you. And one of the things that he's interested in, one of the things that he's, he wants to do by the ministry of his spirit in his church is to have you experience intimacy and relational depth with him, a kind of closeness with him. And maybe it's been a long time since you've experienced that. So I just want to remind you that he loves you. He wants to draw you actually near to experience that closeness with him, to stir our love for him. And and one of the ways in which he does that by his spirit is through worship, is through gathering together on Sundays to sing songs, to pray prayers, to hear his word preached, to take the Lord's Supper. All of these are means to feel close. There are other means individually where pray and read and um, meditate on scripture. And that, that God uses those things too. But he's using times like this right now to draw us close. And I just want to encourage you to be open to that to maybe be intentionally paying attention to that dynamic, that actually we're not just drawing, trying to draw near to God, He's drawing us to Himself. So with that in mind, I want to call you to worship. If you feel comfortable standing, would you? And we're going to read this together, and I'm going to ask you to read the italicized portions with me. This is from Psalm 86. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name, for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love towards me. You have delivered me from the depths, from the realm of the dead. Let's sing together.
Let's hear God's word from Isaiah 29. The Lord says, These people come near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. If we're honest with ourselves and with one another, our worship, our acts of service, and our obedience often conflicts with the posture of our heart. Outwardly we comply, we do lip service to God, and inwardly we're numb, we're apathetic. We've lost the ability to respond out of love. It's a great comfort that the Father's desire is not our achievement. It's not even primarily our obedience, it's our love. He wants us. So as we sing, let's draw near to the Lord, knowing that He is drawing near to us. I have lost my appetite and a flood Welling up behind my eyes So I eat the tears I cry And if that were not enough They know just the words to cut And tear and pry When they ask me where's your God Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? I can remember when you showed your face to me As a deer pants for water, so my soul thirsts for you and when I survey your splendor, you so faithfully renew Like a bed of rest for my fainting flesh I am satisfied in When I'm looking at the ground It's an in-red feedback loop That drags me down 
So it's time to lift my brow And remember better days When I love to worship you And learn your ways With the sweetest songs of Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? I can remember when you showed your face to me As a deer pants for water, so my soul thirsts for you Splendor you so faithfully renew Like a bed of rest For my fainting flesh I am satisfied in you Let my sighs give way to songs that sing about My pain reveal your glory as my only rest. Let my losses show me all I truly am is you. Cause all I truly So when I'm drowning out at sea And all your breakers and your waves Crash down on me I'll recall your safety scheme You're the one who made the waves And your son went out to suffer in my place Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? I am satisfied in you.
Cling to the crucified Jesus the Lamb who died Cling to the crucified Jesus the King Cling to the crucified Jesus the Lamb who died Cling to the crucified Jesus the Let's read this together from Philippians 3. I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Friends, we have a hope that's unwavering. We have a righteousness that belongs to Christ and an intimacy, a love that's been given to us as a gift. So in this good news, let's share the peace of Christ with one another now. Today's reading of God's Word comes from Revelation 2, 1 through 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, 
and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the work you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we are in this sermon series through the book of Revelation. And in chapter 2, which is where we're looking at now, it takes this shift. It, it turns its attention away from the throne room of Christ, which is the beginning of the book of Revelation. It's the whole interpretive grid of this Christ is supreme. He's the king. He's this transcendent king who is the most determinative thing in history. Not our circumstances, not rulers, not kings, not presidents, um, but Christ. And it, it shifts its attention away from that now to churches. you got to remember, this is a letter, right? This is a letter to seven different churches and churches in certain places, certain times with real people, real, real circumstances. And all of these letters, these seven letters, have a similar pattern. There's a greeting, then a commendation, this is what you're doing well, or, and then a, a correction, this is what I have against you, then grounds for encouragement, then a warning. Not, not every letter is, is the same. Two of the churches don't receive a correction, they only receive commendation. And then two churches uh, don't receive any commendation, only correction. And so they're not all the same, but they, they follow a certain pattern. Now, I want to say something about the number seven, all right? Numbers in the book of Revelation and in apocalyptic literature are oftentimes used symbolically. In other words, seven, seven churches, seven means something. Now, we should have some caution and wisdom here. You can get sort of carried away with, with numerology in the book of Revelation, right? This number and this number connects this time and this place with this figure, and this is going to happen on this time, and that's when the world's going to end. No, no, no. <laughs> A good principle for understanding how numbers are used in Revelation. It's deeper than this. It's more complex, but here's a good starting point, all right? A, a good principle for understanding how numbers are used in the book of Revelation is that numbers are used more as an imagery of wholeness than codes to decipher, right? They're used as, as imagery of wholeness rather than codes to decipher, right? Of this number means that place, and this number means that person who's going to come at this time, and no, no, no. Seven is, in the Bible, is, is an image of wholeness. Seven days of creation. On the seventh day, there's rest. There's a sense of existential wholeness. I mean, that's true for the number three. That's true for the number 144,000 in chapter seven and 12,000. And we'll get to all these, these numbers later, but numbers are used this way in apocalyptic literature. So what Revelation 2 is doing, it, he's, he's writing to real local churches in real time, in real place, but it's also written to give us a sense of what wholeness might look like for churches on any time and any place. Does that make sense? He's writing to particular churches, seven churches, but he's writing also to give a sense of what, what wholeness might look like for churches in any time, in any place, not just first century Asia Minor. Does that make sense? And so what does this mean? What the book of Revelation is doing is helping us see what does it mean for churches to experience wholeness? 
What are the ideals they ought to pursue and aim for? And what are the cautions that they need to be aware of and think about? And so he's beginning with Ephesus, a church. And we'll just look at these three things. What does Christ celebrate? What does he confront? And what are the steps towards wholeness? All right, what does he celebrate? What does he confront? And how does he guide us towards towards wholeness? So first, what does he celebrate? Well, there's a lot to celebrate. In verses 2 and 3, Jesus says, I know your works. I know. I see it. It's not hidden from me. Your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who do evil. But you've tested. He says they they haven't put up with false teachers. They've tested people who have called themselves apostles, but they've proven not to be apostles. They've proven to be false. He says, I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you've not grown weary. There's a lot to this Ephesians church. They seem to be doing well in some measure. They, They would be what we might call a faithful church. Their works give evidence of their commitment. They are committed to God. They have an allegiance to Him, and it shows on how they behave. And he he uses repeated words for suffering, that they are enduring. He says that twice about them, that they are bearing up. He says that twice about them. They have had to endure. And Jesus commends them that you have not grown weary. I mean, how many times does the Bible talk about not growing weary, right? Even Paul, don't grow weary of doing good. They haven't. They are persevering for the sake of Christ. They are suffering and enduring. There's this kind of noble presence. Do you know? I'm reading this book. um, It's called The Memory of Old Jack. It's a novel by Wendell Berry. And... The main character, uh, Jack, he's a farmer, uh, and he's, he's had to endure so much. He's, he's a complex character. There's, there's dignity, but there's also failure. And he's had to endure so much suffering in his life, so much surpri- a surprising amount of suffering. And there's this scene where maybe his greatest loss, where he, his, he's, his barn is burning, all the animals and livestock in it are going up in flames, and he's just standing there digesting his loss. And the narrator describes his posture, he says, as a man who has already endured worse than he expected and who knows that he can endure still worse. A man who has already endured worse than he expected and who knows that he can endure still worse. Man, in a season like 2020 where it feels like we've all endured worse than we'd expected, you know, and and that line, as someone, he's describing someone who knows that he can endure still worse. There's something in him deeper still that describes him, that he can still endure more. There's something deeper still. That hits me. I mean, some of you, I know you have endured so much. And when I look at you and I talk to you, there's that same witness of of something in you that can endure still worse. This describes many of you. And Jesus sees that. Jesus commends that. And this describes Ephesus. They are not a flash in the pan church. There is something deeper still in them that can endure more. And Jesus recognizes it. He sees it. And they're vigilant against false teaching, right? And when it says that they were able to test false teachers and even reject um, the the Nicolaitans in verse 6, the Nicolaitans were sort of this group of Christian sect that also participated in temple prostitution and thought Christians should be able to do that. And they rejected them, and they, they swerved. They didn't swerve away from truth, truth, and they didn't trust in hucksters just trying to get power. They tested what was true. The Ephesian church could call evil evil and without worrying about the cultural costs. They were what you might call a truth church, right? A truth church, and they persevered in it. They, they even suffered for the truth when they needed to. 
And Jesus commends them. But he also confronts them. What does he confront? Well, he confronts a loss of love. He says in verse 4, But this I have against you, that you have abandoned your first love. You've abandoned the love that you had. They were a truth church, and that's good, but they had lost the warmth of love. There's something in them that had gone out. It isn't quite clear exactly what John is getting at, whether it's a love for God and everything they're doing now is just out of obligation and duty, or they've lost something characteristic of love towards others. It's probably both. They've probably both lost this sense of love towards God and love towards others. It's what Martin Lloyd-Jones called sort of like a, a cold orthodoxy. Truth without the fire of the love of Christ. The fire had gone out. The same fire that Jesus seemed to have in the Gospels, right? Jesus was a truth guy. He had no patience for the falsehoods of the Pharisees. But he also, at the same time, wept and comforted the, those who were mourned. He touched the lepers. He was present with the poor. He, he, he died for his enemies. And it, and it seems like the Ephesian church at one point had this kind of love, this steel strength and this depth of love, but now the love had cooled. How does that happen? What, why does the love go out like this? Maybe you have examples of this in mind where you know truth people who don't seem to have a whole lot of love. What happens? How does this happen? We, we may know examples of how this, of when, when this happens, but how? I think there might be a few explanations we can explore that might be helpful. Um, first, a first reason might be that, that suffering can actually make love really difficult. Marva Dawn, I love Marva Dawn. She's written several books that I've loved, um, but she's written a, a, a little book on Revelation, seen through a sufferer. She says sometimes um, putting up with physical handicaps can get so hard that suffering individuals start to become terribly inward turned. She says, we, and she's a sufferer herself, she says, we have to focus on, on trying to take care of ourselves, and it's such a time-consuming chore that it throttles any desire to help others, and we, we lose a sense of grace and a desire of joy in worship. I, she says, I experienced this as she was, she says, I experienced this as I was writing this book. She always had suffered um, chronic pain for most of her adult life, and she had sores on what she said were her shattered feet. And these sores were increasing the likelihood of amputation, which would require extra days of orthopedic specialists and multiple cast changes and adjustments. And she says, it's hard living in response to God's grace, living lovingly in response to God's grace when we can't understand why we have to suffer unreasonable pain and anxious distress. Now, I think that's really perceptive because it seems like the people in Ephesus really did suffer greatly, didn't they? That's what Jesus points out at the beginning. He addresses this, and they had persevered. But maybe it seemed their love of God and their love of others had cooled along the way as they had suffered so much. And Jesus is concerned now that Obligation is what is driving their faith, driving their action, and it will not sustain their endurance in a way only that love can sustain their endurance. So I wonder if we can begin here when we're thinking about Ephesus and maybe just how truth people can lack love. Maybe we can begin with a little bit of empathy. And, and, and maybe people in your life who, who you're imagining, heesh, they're kind of prickly, Maybe begin with empathy, especially in this season. That, and this is what Jesus does. Maybe our first response shouldn't be hammering the sin, but understanding the sufferer. I mean, we should follow Jesus here. He first gives dignity to the suffering before addressing the sin. 
I think that's important for us to grasp and understand as a church community. But the second reason why maybe love can be lost when truth and perseverance is, is sought is that oftentimes we, we pursue truth and perseverance through suffering in order to justify ourselves. I mean, this is not a, a church that's backsliding morally or theologically. They, they, they don't lack zeal or endurance. They just lack love. And all of their efforts seem to come out of obligation. And Jesus is heartbroken about this because maybe secretly they are proud, they are standing for truth and enduring suffering while other churches have faded away. I mean, their lives are energized by comparing themselves to others in order to feel a sense of superiority or a sense, you know, trying to fill up a lack of insecurity in their own heart. Or, or maybe they've just fallen in love with their own goodness. Rather than being energized by the love of Christ, which, which fuels love and service for others. I mean, I, I wonder, does that dynamic maybe show up in your own heart? Is, is that where your heart goes? That your goodness and, and actions of love are really at some deeper level just a way to either deal with some insecurity or to, to deal with some way of justifying yourself, of comparing yourself towards others. I say secretly because maybe it, it's at work more under the hood of the heart. And, and maybe this, this rebuke that Jesus has for the Ephesus church, it would be a little bit more of a surprise for them, right? Lost our love. What do you, what do you mean? Look at all I've done for you. I, I've done all of these works for you. What do you mean I've lost my love? Or, you know, when a spouse says, do you love me? And the response is, do I love you? Wait, look at all I do for you. Yeah, but I don't, I don't sense your love in it. I sense more of an obligation. I sense more of a duty than love. And and what's maybe hidden, maybe even to the Ephesus, is what they do is not out of love, but out of a sense of self-justification to feel good about themselves, to feel some sense of superiority towards others because we've sensed of insecurity for so long. And oftentimes those those motivations are hidden from us. We don't always see them. They're not always obvious. It's mixed, but it's not hidden from Christ. He sees even when we don't see. And so Jesus then, he, he gives us steps towards wholeness. He leads us. He, doesn't, he, he wants to expose what's happening in our own heart and then leads us towards wholeness. And it's not overly complicated, very simple. I probably won't say anything. If you've been around in this church, you probably won't say anything surprising, but I think it's important to point out that this is where Jesus is leading. He says in verse five, remember therefore where you have fallen. Remember your old love, repent and do the works that you did at first. This repent and return, turn back to your old love and your, your former ways. He says, revive your old love. He's calling him not just to repent, but be, to, but be to revived, to be revived. In, in other words, he's wanting this church to seek revival which you know, can be defined this way. Revival can be defined as seeking old realities with a new vitality. Seeking old realities with a new vitality, with a new perseverance. Go back. Experience your love for Christ with a new power that sustains you through suffering and fills up your dead doctrines with joy. Now, how? How do, we, how, do we, how do we revive ourselves? I mean, if you know anything about spiritual revival and renewal, we know we can't manipulate it, we can't do it, we can't, we can't make it happen. Sort of like Paul in Ephesians 5, he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a command. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, how? What do you mean? What, what does that look like? And, and this is a little bit of what Jesus is telling us, right? Revi be revived. Revive your old love. And so he teaches us how. Okay, remember. Remember when you first discovered and experienced the love of Christ. Go back and remember the freedom. 
Remember the excitement. And we have a tendency maybe to think back on that time. And since the love didn't last, since it wasn't disdained, we kind of tend to think, well, we must have been naive. We, it, we must have just been simplistic. And I, what Jesus wants you to hear is, no, no, no. You were not naive to be so excited and feel so free. You just didn't allow it to go down deep enough. It was too shallow. You need new depths in a way that a marriage cannot depend on initial fire of love, right? That initial fire and spark of love only sustains through a honeymoon and maybe a few weeks afterwards. Something deeper has to sustain you for the years ahead. And that's true for friendships or any relationship, right? That spark of interest, that commonality, that can't sustain a friendship. There has to be something deeper. There has to be self-sacrifice. There has to be presence. There has to be longevity. There has to be something deeper that sustains you. To revive a love of a friend means you have to go back and then go back with a new perseverance, a new vitality. And that's more profoundly true with God. Remember your first love, but seek it with a new vitality. And then do the works you did at first. He's just talking about, listen, go back to your old spiritual habits that maybe now have gone stale. Renew them. Practicing them differently now in seasons of suffering and growth behind you. You've grown up. You're, not, you're no longer just a newly minted Christian, but you have experiences behind you. You have depths that spiritual habits and singing and friendships and reading the Bible and reading books, they might, may find new life in you, may find new ways of ministering to you, of sustaining you. Or, or even deeper than that, serving others. Remember when you first became a Christian and you had this sort of, this instinct to serve, this desire to be present and to serve and to follow up and to be near, and now that's grown cold. And Jesus is saying, go back, go back to serving others with a new attention to love. Or maybe practice disciplines that you've always ignored, like fasting or discipline or or reading books that you've always thought were boring. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, gosh, this is just habits. These are actions. Do do new habits or old habits, do they really revive me? No, absolutely not. Power is not in habits. We've said this a million times. Habits do not bring revival. Spiritual disciplines do not renew us. They put us in the way of renewal. Right? They put us in the posture of receiving what Christ may have for us. They open us up to what Christ may give us by His Spirit. Right? It puts us, putting on these new habits or these old habits and these spiritual practices puts us in the way of renewal. But there is one thing that with these renewal, what comes What's really important to accompany these practices of renewal is the presence of Christ. And that's what Jesus is offering here. Christ says in verse 1, I am the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now remember we've said that the lampstands is the church. And now this language, walks among, is this allusion back to the beginning of Genesis in the Garden of Eden, this scene where God walks among the garden in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. It's the same language, it's back and forth. It's, it's given an allusion back to that scene, this presence among them, that God's presence was what gave them vitality and joy and love. That's what, that's what His presence did. And, and later in the passage, it says, Those who pursue love, who seek to revive their love, they will eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. That's that's experiencing joy in His presence in the end. That's the new heavens and the new earth. So it's at the beginning of the Bible and at the end of the Bible, right? The, The beginning of creation and the end of the new creation. It's pointing to God's presence with us. That's what revives us. That's what refreshes us. What happened in the garden and what will happen in the new creation, that's the dynamic that's happening now, that Christ is among his church. He's with us. He's with us. In other words, we remember our first love and we pick up old spiritual habits that we've lost or let grown cold. 
in the presence of Christ. That's what renews us. We remember our old love and we pick up old habits in the presence of Christ. The power for renewal of our old love and our repentance is the presence and the power of Christ who's among us. The presence of Christ is what breathes on our dry bones of cold doctrine, what puts vitality into our repentance and power into our practices. The Spirit, what fills us, is what makes these actions of remembering and repenting and restoring old works as powerful and renewing. What Christ is asking us to pursue is love in these things. Pursue me. That's the end. The end of this, ha these habits and this repentance is Christ, not something beyond Christ, not something beyond Him, not an object beyond Him, but Him. He's saying, don't be a Christian just to be a Christian. Don't be a follower of Jesus because it gives you purpose. Don't be a Christian because it puts order in your life. Not because your closest friends become a Christian because they're a Christian or because your family members are Christian but because Christ is beautiful and you love him. All, all the other reasons why you become a Christian will turn out to be vain if it is not from loving Christ. That won't sustain your faith. Christ is calling a church that is persevering and doing hard work to remember what's first. And that's love. Loving Him. Look back and remember your love. If your love has grown cold in this season, and it's okay, some of us have suffered. Jesus is patient with our suffering. He's patient with us when our love has grown cold. But He calls us. Remember your love. Remember what you have forfeited. Remember what you've set aside. Come back to me. Pursue practices that blow into the flames of your love for Christ and see what the Spirit does. I'm hopeful for that. Let's pray. Father, I'm, we're asking for help. Um, our habits, our disciplines, our rhythms will just be flesh without your presence and your power. So I ask that you would give us the presence and the power of Christ among us as we pursue love, that you would stir it and revive us, renew us. Even in this season of confusion, would one thing be really clear? that we love you and it stirs us and that it would come from the experience of being loved by you and your presence walking among us. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, let's sing. Bring
your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes and new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar read together from 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Our love toward God and toward others, the most important things we can give, will only be sustained by receiving and internalizing God's love toward us. So as we worship through giving and as we sing, Let's pray that God would awake in our hearts to receive what's already ours in Christ. Let's sing. Awesome wonder, consider all. 
works thy hands at me. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy path throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God. Father, we, we ask for help now as we um, end our service. We, we know that you're great. Um, we confess that you're great. But also, your, your love is great. You have loved us so deeply, so thoroughly, so intimately, so gently. Um, and we've often let our love grow cold. And so we just ask by your spirit that you would help us. You would awaken us. You would pull back uh, the things that blind us or the things that numb us from love, from deep love. That's when we're most happy. That's when we're most free is when we love most fully. And so we just, we just ask for mercy that you would revive us in that way. Lead us in that way as a good shepherd would, Lord. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, all right, friends, it's good to, it's good to be with you today. Um, just want to remind you, we're about halfway through the uh, month of October, just to encourage you to sustain your generosity and caring for the finances of our church. We're doing well so far this month, so thank you for caring for us. Um, and we're going to take the Lord's Supper on, on the Zoom link below. So have your bread and your cup ready, and uh, I'll see you in a few minutes. See you.